Okay, welcome to the Night All session. Um, thanks to GMF for putting us together here to discuss what is, of course, an extremely important subject, which is the energy security of Europe. And we will also, of course, try to explore whether the, um, there is a transatlantic dimension to this. Um, it is still a very hot topic. Um, not too long ago, um, the majority of uh, European Union countries were cut off from their gas supplies coming from Russia. There were people freezing in many European countries. Factories stood idle. And we're still now trying to digest the lessons from that. I will start by briefly introducing our excellent panel. Um, we will then have a short conversation, but I want to draw as many as you into the debate um, fairly quickly. I'll start with Anna Palacio, who probably understands linkage between foreign policy and energy and law, it's got to be said, better than anybody else. She was Spanish foreign minister um, in Aznar's government five years ago. Um, she was also a member of both the Spanish and the European Parliament, where she um, ran the internal market and the legal affairs committees. She's a distinguished lawyer, and one of her many jobs that she had in that capacity was as the general counsel of the World Bank. With a foreign policy head on, she also sits on the board of just about every single prestigious foreign policy think tank in the world. And since last year, Anna Palacio has been vice president for international relations of Arriva, the French nuclear group. To my left, I have Tatiana Mitrova, who is an economist by background. She's one of Russia's most high-profile um, analysts on energy matters. She's not only a consultant, but she also attracts a lot of attention through her writings. In particular, she often warns that the EU-Russia energy relationship could turn into a loose-loose situation if there's no trust and no long-term contracts on which to base it. For the last three years, Tatiana has been the head of the Center for International Energy Market Studies at the Energy Department of the Russian Academy of Science. Alexander Vondra, um, very much the public face of the Czech presidency of the EU in his capacity of deputy prime minister uh, for EU affairs. Energy was always supposed to be one of the priorities of the Czech presidency, but I think few people would have predicted just how urgent the matter would be at the beginning of your presidency when Russia and Ukraine turned off the taps to Europe. Sasha Mondra started his political career in the Czechoslovak democratic opposition movement in the 1980s, and by the early 1990s, he was foreign policy advisor to Václav Havel. He has also been Czech ambassador to the U.S. and foreign minister. Last but not least, Karl Theodor von zu Gutenberg was recently appointed German economics minister, the country's youngest ever. This came after a fairly dizzying rise through the ranks of the Christian Social Union, which is the Bavarian sister party of Angela Merkel's CDU. One of the many things that uh, Mr. Gutenberg's ministry is in charge of is, of course, energy. Mr. Gutenberg has also been um, the, his party, the CDU-CSU um, representative to the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Bundestag, and he's probably one of the most prominent spokespeople of his party on many issues of foreign affairs. He's also on record as saying that Germany should extend the life of its nuclear power stations and diversify its energy resources away from Russia. Um, please welcome our panel. Let me start with you, Sasha Wondra. When the gas dispute started between Russia and Ukraine in January, your government's initial reaction was, let's not get involved. But then you actually played a very hands-on role in trying to um, end the standoff, going back and forth between Moscow and Kiev and Brussels. And you're now equally intimately involved in helping the European Union to draw the lessons from this crisis in January. Would you explain to us, please, what these lessons are? Well, I think this lesson is that, you know, we had a lot of talks about the solidarity in, within the EU. Uh, for example, you know, this is a part of the Lisbon Treaty. There, there, there are the clause uh, related exactly uh, to the energy security. But once we are confronted with the problem, uh, the paper means simply nothing. and. Uh, we have to be prepared materially, uh, legally, operationally. And 
I think that the magnitude of that crisis, because look, it was not for the first time, but what was the first time was the complete cut, which lasted approximately three weeks. So that was a new, and it brought some countries uh, into a serious problems. I would stress two uh, special cases, and that's uh, Bulgaria and Slovakia. I, I would say that you know this combination of two countries is very important also in the b larger geopolitical uh, setup and the quality of the relationship with, uh, with Russia. So to a certain extent, it could be played even intentionally. Uh, and I think that the lesson was that we have to uh, be ready to react on this crisis immediately with a system of the technical, legal, and other measures. And to certainly, to certain extent, the response, I believe, the first serious response was coming today, uh, when we, with the European Council, has approved this package, this so-called five billion projects uh, on to improve the energy security. And a substantial part of this is dedicated to improve the gas interconnections. For example, the Slovaks, they were not able to reverse the flow of the gas in their pipeline. We were able to, uh, to, to, to supply them with the gas on some kind of an emergency basis, I mean, as the Czechs, Germans and others, but they did not have uh, the compressors to be able to reverse the flow. For Bulgaria, the problem was uh, uh, even more uh, difficult because they, they are lacking uh, the alternative interconnections. So this idea, you know, that in the short and medium term we will build the new interconnections, we will build the facilities to be able to reverse the flow and also to support the various diversification measures. So I'm very glad, for example, that we were able to find the agreement on Nabucco despite some, uh, some hesitations. Uh, uh, Nabucco is on the list. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tatiana, how does it look from Russia? Um, can you explain to us what went on in these early days in January when uh, Russia decided to first reduce the flow of gas and then um, cut it all off together? And what are the lessons that Russia is, is drawing from this crisis? I'm afraid that here in this auditory I have the most difficult role uh, <laughs> to explain what the hell was going on and how could it happen? <laughs> and actually, believe me, for Russia it was an uh, extremely difficult decision and extremely difficult situation, especially, you know, if you are supplying gas for uh, more than 40 years and you are very proud of your reputation of reliable supplier, you face uh, this uh, situation and you don't have any choice other than to, to do what was done, uh, it's really very, very difficult. And everybody understood the, uh, what the reaction uh, from the European Union would be, and everybody understood, as you have mentioned, that the most suffering countries uh, would be uh, the closest partners of Russia, historical partners like uh, Balkan countries. Uh, so it was really very difficult, but at the same time, look, uh, for the last, uh, let's say, 15 years, uh, Russia was trying uh, to uh, ask Europe to pay more attention to Ukrainian transit issues. It was the topic for numerous discussions and appeals, and in 2006, actually, what Russia was asking from the European Union, like, hey, guys, look, it's not just our problem, it's the problem of the whole Europe as well. Uh, Ukraine is not more uh, part of the Soviet Union, and Russia cannot uh, force it to fulfill its obligations on transit. So therefore, uh, e energy security, it consists of three elements, security of supply, security of demand, and security of transit. If one of the elements fails, the whole system is unsustainable. And here, uh, all these relationship and transit crisis over the Ukraine, it demands uh, efforts from both sides, not only from Russia, but from Europe. And the biggest lesson from this crisis, from, in my mind, is that for the first time, Europe has shown understanding of this situation. For the first time, European companies 
they uh, understood that they cannot avoid involvement in this uh, crisis. And they, uh, as you know, they've proposed to make this consortium for technical gas and so on and so on. It was the uh, reaction from the business side and it is actually extremely important. So now it's the, qu the question is uh, where to move and what can be done in order to avoid uh, such sort of situations in the future. Okay, well, what is Russia doing? Is, okay. it, is, it, is, is this going to speed up the Nord Stream project? Is well, the South of Stream course, project of course as, it, it, as everybody says, first of all, diversification. And uh, from the Russian side, it's diversification of transit, uh, of transportation routes, and uh, it means, first of all, North Stream and South Stream, which are, uh, despite crisis and despite all financial difficulties, all energy companies in the world are facing, uh, they are going on and uh, even faster than it was intended uh, initially. So uh, it's first of all. Uh, secondly, it's development of uh, underground storage facilities inside Europe in order to some how uh, sustain the uh, supply flows in case of emergency. And uh, of course, uh, it is uh, all uh, the efforts uh, to find some uh, decision uh, with Ukrainian transit, because you see, uh, in any situation, uh, it is impossible to diversify for Europe 120 BCM of gas going from Russia through Ukraine. It's simply physically impossible. And therefore, speaking about all alternative projects, LNG, Nabucco, whatever, uh, we have to have in mind that we cannot avoid uh, the transit problem by the end of the day. It has to be solved, and there is a need for a new framework. That's what Russia was proposing, to try to think about new mechanisms, what to do, how to manage this situation. The former framework, it was developed in the times of the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, when uh, there was no transit problem at all, and the gas was sold on the border, actually. That's it. But now, when there are so many participants in this chain, there is a need for some multilateral framework in order to uh, protect interests of all the parties involved. So I think it's really a very important topic for discussion. I think we might come back to the Energy Charter Treaty a little later. Um, Mr. Gutenberg, Germany's energy relations with Russia are fairly sound, and I think the progress on Nord Stream, a direct link from Russia to Germany and obviously other European countries as well, is, is good evidence of that. I've heard you saying in the past that on... Russia and on energy specifically, the European Union must speak with one voice. What does energy solidarity mean um, in the European context? Sasha has already pointed to the term solidarity and uh, I think it's not enough just to talk about solidarity and to use it as a typical nostalgic European phrase but also to fill it with life and there is there's one sentence that has been created that means there's no solidarity without responsibility and exactly that amount of responsibility we do need and and that means measures that have to be taken in any single member state and as we have a I think we have conceded on a on a graduated process that takes into account first the companies then the member states and then the European framework as such and the homework that has to be done may it be investments in infrastructure, may it be those things that uh, Sasha has already mentioned, uh, which I think were pointed at, at uh, in, the, in, the, in the council resolution today. And, 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 and I was I just was given the thing here to me what uh, caused the prime minister to say that he is more skeptic than ever now. I don't know where that actually came from, <laughs> but. It, it, <laughs> but we are very proud to be here. I think you can be proud because you have mentioned you have mentioned the right things in here, and 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 you have you have you have pointed at the adequate crisis mechanisms. You have pointed at um, at solidarity and other things. But we have to fill it with we have to fill it with with life. And and speaking with one voice is even mentioned here. Um, in brackets, by the way, I think we need it as <laughs> we need it as a clear sentence. And where we have to be careful is, and and I'm also looking to Tatiana here. I think we have to be very very cautious that speaking with one voice is is made possible, and 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 that we don't outwit ourselves. 
and that others don't use. And I'm not talking about others in a, in a very abstract way, but uh, we have to be very, very cautious and careful that energy policy doesn't equal foreign policy as such. And that's a very simplistic phrase, but one we have to be aware of. And, and in, that, in that regard, I think it is a major step forward that we have, that we have uh, a, not only a paper here, but also substance. Although I give you all credits um, uh, when, you were, uh, when you were mentioning Nabucco and, and, and our euphoric willingness to embrace it, although I, <laughs> although, although I absolutely do see the necessity. This is part of energy diversity. And um, with, some, with some respect, I would just like to, <laughs> to cite uh, or to quote the sentence that is the solution now. It means it invites the Commission to present by the end of the year proposal for concrete action on the development of the Southern Corridor, including um, me mechanisms to facilitate access to Caspian gas. This is Europe. How to avoid Nabucco? No, no, no. But In, you, do not, you do not have the annex to that. There is the annex. <laughs> and in the annex, there is Nabucco and 200 million euros. Okay, Sasha. <laughs> this is Europe then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the small print. Um, Anne Palacio, diversification has been mentioned a few times already. Now, diversification obviously doesn't only mean uh, different pipeline routes and trying to get access. Um, to new sources of gas in the Caspian. It also has to do something with the energy mix. Um, nuclear is part of such an energy mix in some European countries, not in others. Does the European Union need a policy on the energy mix, or is that something we should leave to the individual countries? Well, allow me one word on the gas issue. Because Tatiana mentioned, two. We, uh, mentioned that the European citizens had understood, Europeans had understood, and then we listened to the minister saying that uh, foreign policy is not energy policy. You know what? The energy, the, uh, the nuclear uh, energy industry is going to create an award, an award for the renaissance of the nuclear in Europe and give it ex equo to President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin because each time they have an issue in this crisis of the gas, we have two or three countries that go back to nuclear. This time it was Sweden, it was Poland, and it was Italy. So for us, uh, frankly, for the industry, <laughs> it's great. Go on with the gas crisis. The only thing is that, frankly, frankly, what the European citizens are demonstrating is that they understood the crisis. They understood the crisis, but probably in a different way than the way that you were implying. So that uh, that's now. I I mean, for me, the issue here is that we are in this transatlantic dialogue. And frankly, today, energy is probably the sweetest of the sweetest part of this, uh, of this honeymoon between, uh, between the two sides of the Atlantic. And if we take uh, your title, this idea, uh, this two part of the sentences, this paradigm, well, we Europeans, we are glowing. Now, the Americans listen to us. It's not just Joe Biden that says it. It's that they listen to us. They have copied. They have come to accept our premises. And on the other side, of course, blame for the Bush administration and just responsibility by the, by the, by the, by the Obama administration. But frankly, the world is much bigger. And honestly, well, the first thing that I think that we Europeans, especially we Europeans that tend to be extremely Eurocentric, we have to understand is that the energy equation in the sense that you were mentioning, in the mix, is, has to be solved at a global level. We may agree or disagree with nuclear, but the reality is that now nuclear is picking up, that China, India, uh, Brazil, that, that, that they have launched big nuclear uh, programs, that in 2030, the, the, the idea, I mean, the projects are that 40% of the nuclear reactors will be in those countries, and not any longer, the, the nuclear country will not be in Europe mainly and in the United States, not at all. So, um, yes, I think that 
in Europe, we have to understand that, A, the reality of the world is that there is a nuclear renaissance, and B, we may, we may think what we want about nuclear, but the, the reality is that energy is a global issue, and we better listen, and we better just uh, influence on the legal framework, on the multilateral institutions. We have to strengthen them. And, uh, and frankly, in the end, uh, we have a margin of maneuver, and maybe in the next crisis, Germany and Spain and, and <laughs> Austria will just go back to nuclear. <laughs> I think we might come back to that. Does anybody want to catch my eye at this present point in time and throw in a question? Yes, please. Um. My name is Arve Torvik. I come from Norway, and I represent, out of all things, a gas pipeline company called the trans Adriatic Pipeline Company. And I have a question to the Czech Minister about his achievement on Nabucco today. Because in this region, to bring the Southern Corridor to reality, there are three competing projects. There's one called the Italy-Greek Interconnector. There's one called the Nabucco Project. And there was one called the trans Adriatic Pipeline Project. The Nabucco Project is estimated to cost 7.9 billion euros, according to public figure, figures. The IGI, we haven't seen figures. Our project is estimated at 1.5 billion. All of them do the final trick of connecting the Caspian gas to the European market. So my question is, why do you throw 200 million euros after the most expensive project, which costs about 8 billion euros, with the least chance of getting to the gas, uh, and thereby distorting competition among three projects trying to do the same thing. I think your preferences on the projects are clear. Why indeed? Why are we throwing money at the problem? I think because we want to diversify. Diversification is one of the most important things. And I think that the current crisis has shown that we need to have the instruments both uh, regarding the Ukraine, and that could be an Nord Stream, I, and I do not see this as a competition to Nabucco. And uh, we need also to have the ability to bring the other than just the Russian gas to Europe. And, it, you know, you can do this with LNG. You can do this uh, terrestrial way, and that's, uh, that's the Nabucco. I understand that you have to promote your project. I know about the skepticism about Nabucco. You know, it goes uh, deep into the history. Uh, in the past, I remember, you know, when we decided to, to diversify it in the Czech Republic with the oil, there was the project of connecting Prague with Ingolstadt. And many people argue, you know, that's not a feasible project, it's, it's useless. It saved us already twice when there were the shortcuts in the Russian oil deliveries by drying Druzhba pipeline. There were a lot of doubts about Baku Chaihan. I think without the American support for this project, and it was a political support in the beginning, there would not be a Baku Chaihan. Now there is a Baku Chaihan, and it serves to diversify the oil terrestrial de deliveries to Europe. And it helps us, it brings the other oil to the raffineries in the Central Europe as well. So, and just maybe the last argument, in just this three week long crisis in January, how much the companies, how much money they have lost? It went to the billions. So I think in this light, the investment amount which is required for Nabucco is not as a big deal. Of course, you have to promote your project, that's logical. Well, just a short comment. You know, when, when we had this crisis in Europe, which, by the way, I mean, already in last September was visible, was coming because uh, there were. Europe was flooded with a bunch of Russian PR experts telling them that Ukraine will make trouble in the, in the winter. Uh, but I, I have to remind you that um, in, 
January 2005, there, are mysterious, there were mysterious explosions on three lines coming from Russia to Georgia. At that moment, uh, in Russian territory. At that moment, Russia, we were depending, we were importing 90% of our energy from Russia, and we had blackout at the coldest time of the year, at the record cold winter, for almost a week, when we switched suddenly to Iranian pipeline, which was there since so many times. But one thing is clear. For all the time of this crisis, Prime Minister Putin mentioned for three times or four times publicly, so we are giving gas even to Georgia now. We get 15% of our gas as paid for transit to Armenia for Russia. The only Putin would have loved to switch off Georgia this winter, except that the point is that since last time in 2005, we learned our lesson. We diversified and we upgraded our hydropower, so we produce energy and we export it to Russia. We no longer import it from it. And we have gas from Azerbaijan with alternative from Iran. So there is no sense to disconnect Georgia now. And that's the lesson for everybody. Uh, you know, Putin boasting that, you know, he's giving gas to Georgia? Give me a break. I mean, he would love to, to freeze that to death. Uh, we know it. Uh, we know it big paranoia. But the, but the point is that there, it's, uh, economically it doesn't make sense. There is an alternative. And I think that's the best case for Europe. Once there is Nabucco, once there are other lines, that there is an alternative, whether it's nuclear energy, and then, then it will make be no sense to switch off Europe. Until, and the, I was surprised when some people in Germany were saying, oh, if we had had Nord Stream now, we would have had no trouble with Ukraine. Excuse me, but next time they don't like some CDU statement in Germany, they will switch off Germany directly. <laughs> uh, that's how they are. Should, shouldn't ask a CSU. <laughs> or CSU, <laughs> for that purpose. <laughs> so, I mean, thank you. Thank you very much. To broaden that point out a bit, um, you said that energy policy or, you know, the European energy market starts with the companies and then so if we move up. Um, how much state involvement do we need? The, the EU energy policy really started as a part of the single market. We liberalize energy just we liberalize every other market. But energy security is a public good, is it not? How much state involvement do we need? Well... <laughs> Not too much, and uh, hopefully not, not not too much. It's 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 quite it's it's a debate we're leading, more or less in 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 in, in actually any public discussion right now. It's uh, is is the state the better entrepreneur in in such regard as well? It's a very a very simplistic answer to to a quite complex question you have asked. I think as as long as as uh, the as as the private sector has the cap capabilities and the capacities to to maneuver in that regard. They should do so and we should give them all opportunities to do so. And if we start with, if we start with the governmental level, with the state, I think we should we turn around the effects we actually would like to have. So I would, I would like to see this graduate process and it has still to be made clear that it starts with the companies, that we may find regional connexes, but also starting with the companies as also a, an instrument that has an early warning uh, aspect in it, maybe. But start there and don't start with the government at the state level. So more market in energy, meaning that unbundling is a good idea? More market, yes. <laughs> unbundling, that was a tricky, tricky question. <laughs> she knows how to do that. <laughs> and I would just mumble as an answer. <laughs> I don't think mumbling is allowed at the Brussels Forum, and it said so in my instructions. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a clear answer. Thank you very much. Um, Sinan. Uh, thank you, Katin. Sinan Ulgan, I'm the chairman of uh, Edam, a, tank, a think tank based in Istanbul. Now, um, I tend to think that one of the reasons why there's so much skepticism around Nabucco is the fact that uh, in terms of the security of supply and the supply sources, there's uncertainty about where that gas is going to come from. Uh, I was interesting to hear Mr. Vondra's comments uh, when he referred to uh, the BTC project. Uh, and I was wondering whether he can be slightly self-critical about the EU in terms of its past performance in getting access to natural gas uh, in the Caspian region. Uh, because when you, when you refer to BTC, BTC was a project 
that had the political backing essentially of the US administration. And it came into being as a result of the political backing of the US administration. The EU had a very minimal role to play in the building of BTC. So at a time when we have offers on the table uh, from the Russian side for the whole output of Azeri gas, when the Chinese are getting into the market in Turkmenistan to buy a share of that country's output, what will be the signs where, as European citizens, we can say that, yes, now the EU is serious about this and they are going to get the gas from the Caspian? It's up to me, huh? <laughs> no mumbles. No, look, uh, in general, I agree with you. I, I told that that it was mostly the American support be, behind the, the BDC and that the European uh, players should do more regarding, regarding the diversification. Uh, you know, we are leading the EU for just for six months, so what we have achieved is a political support for Nabucco in March. And what we are trying to prepare is the sudden corridor meeting in, in, in May to bring uh, the, the leaders of, of uh, Azerbaijan, of Turkmenistan and some other Central Asian countries to meet in Europe. And we are also pushing for concluding the central governmental agreement on that. Uh, you know, you need all the players to... Uh, and Turkey, I think, in fact, uh, is a key country in that. So if you can help to convince the authorities in, in Turkey uh, to play a constructive uh, role as a transit country uh, in, in, in that project, I think it would be extremely helpful. In fact, if I see some problems, you know, of course, it's a European hesitation. There are some differences of view, but we are able to overcome this now, but Turkey is a key country. Turkey is, 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 is the most important. Well, Turkey argues that, if I understand it correctly, says to the European Union, if you want to talk to us about energy, talk to us about energy in the framework of the EU and accession negotiations, which, of course, the European Union cannot do because the energy chapter is blocked. Any chance of unblocking the energy chapter anytime soon? Well, we are making a research. It's, uh, you know, that is uh, related... Uh, uh, in, 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 in the eyes of some players uh, with the situation in Cyprus. So uh, uh, I just uh, can hope that uh, this year we can have some progress in uh, solving the, the Cyprus issue and then uh, certainly this issue should be, should be an incentive to uh, do as much as, as they can to, 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 f to, s to start to fix the problems. There. So yes, energy chapter is uh, the really important one. Thank you, Tomasz Malaszek. I'm Slovak, but I'm, uh, I work in London for the Center for European Reform. I hate to turn this into Sasha Vondra show, but my question is, uh, again, to you, if I may. Uh, without sort of getting into playing game for the um, uh, gas war in, in January, I think we would all agree that Europe's energy security would be strengthened if Ukrainian transit system was a little more transparent and better managed. Uh, so three questions following from that. What do you expect to come out of the March 23rd meeting, is it? Second, um, what sort of changes in the long run would you like to see in a way the Ukrainian pipeline system is managed uh, in terms of transparency? And if you had the presidency for another two, three years, which you won't if Carbuild has anything to say on that. Um, <laughs> what sort of leverage or incentives would you like to apply? What, what leverage and incentives does the EU have vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine to introduce more transparency in the, uh, in the energy system? Well, the, 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 the general leverage is the bypassing Ukraine. That's, that's the leverage. North Stream, South Streams, those are the leverages. Certainly, we still would need Ukraine as a transit country for the Russian gas, because even if you can imagine all those alternative routes uh, uh, to be operational, still, you know, we would need uh, we would need more capacity. And if this uh, climate energy legislation will fully enter into force, it would uh, uh, it would require even more gas. That's you know, if you if you study. Uh, uh, the investment uh, needs of, of, of the power generation companies 
and you know with all the respect for Areva efforts you know to uh, to cause another uh, another crisis in the Ukrainian uh, relationship and uh, you know on, on this play right house, on this playground uh, we are moving ahead as, as well uh, on the nuclear energy if you read carefully the com uh, the conclusion of the of the today's council there is the support for the nuclear energy if the country wish to do so, <laughs> you know the language, uh, but there is the support, <laughs> uh, but back, uh, back to... That's, that's Europe. It's not just about uh, addendums and uh, annexes, and, uh, yeah. just, it's about It's, it's directly about language. In this, uh, directly in the yeah, conclusion, but it, but in no annex. Well, but what, but what conclusion <laughs> is, you can do if you want, it's in your competencies. But I think I have to back to the question on, on the Monday's meeting in, 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 in Brussels. I think it's important. I think it's very good that the meeting takes place. Uh, a week ago, you know, we were not certain whether uh, the Ukrainian delegation accepts all the conditions set up by, by, by the Commission. And, and those conditions are going in favor of having a more transparent environment there. And I think that we terribly need it. That, that's one of the lessons or another lesson which we have learned, uh, learned from the crisis. And that's also the reason why, you know, you mentioned that originally, you know, the first week we, we were talking that uh, uh, we are not going directly uh, to be engaged in those, uh, in those disputes. Of course, because we did not to be in a situation of having a Schwarze Petr card game in, in our hands of uh, those who are going to pay uh, for, 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 for the consequences of this fully. So need more transparency and I believe that, uh, you know, this donor conference can lead to a solution. Now, transparency is not only something that concerns us when it comes to um, Ukrainian transit, but it's also um, something that we wonder about in the case of Russian gas production. Um, if I'm correct, the latest figures from early March show that Gazprom's output is down by almost a quarter on the, av on the average of 2008. No, um, no, 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 no. Uh, it's a wrong figure. Uh, it ne it's nearly stable with a little decline, but month to month uh, uh, production in this year, it is really declining. But there is a very simple reason for that, lack of demand. Okay. So they have to reduce production, though it's technologically rather challenging. People who know how gas industry uh, is working understand that it's not so easy just to uh, close the well and decrease the pressure in the pipeline. But uh, as the uh, European demand is stagnating, and it, uh, it, ha it started uh, as early as in October, actually, Russian gas exports to Europe started to decline because European uh, industry doesn't need so much gas uh, due to industrial output decline. And domestic uh, gas consumption is also declining because the most energy intensive industries like metallurgical, uh, construction, cement, and so on, uh, they, it's suffering a lot uh, because of crisis, and they also don't need as much gas as it was supposed to. So all producers, not only gas, uh, Gazprom, but also independent producers, oil companies, uh, they are reducing their output. There is no market. But looking a bit further into the future, there's quite a few people in Europe who don't worry so much about um, Russia's willingness to sell us gas, but about its ability to do so, looking sort of 10 to 20 years ahead. Um, the big uh, Siberian fields are all exhausted, mm -hmm. and we're still waiting for the big new fields in Yamal and Stockman to be started up, and perhaps it's not going to get any easier in a very capital short environment. Um, what, is the, what is the production outlook for Russia? Would Russia actually be able to comply with its contractual obligations to Europe, um, sell us additional gas, mm -hmm. satisfy its domestic demand and sell more gas to Asia as Putin repeatedly said it should. Well, you see, uh, it will take several minutes to <laughs> describe Russian gas balance. Well, uh, starting from the depleting fields in the western Siberia, yes, they are in, uh, in production uh, since 1970s, uh, but still uh, the uh, resources rested in one particular field in uh, Yamburg are more than the whole resources of Algeria. 
So uh, now these uh, three big fields uh, in Nadim Portas area, they are producing 85% of all Russian gas, and uh, they will peak in 2012-2013, but uh, then uh, the decline is inevitable, uh, and uh, at least uh, it will reach, uh, in 2015, it will reach the level of 2007 production. So anyway, there are uh, many measures for brownfield management and uh, development of satellite fields and deeper horizons uh, in these uh, existing fields. So this production, it's not just disappearing. It will be uh, very significant. Uh, concerning Yimal, you know, uh, last year uh, not so many journalists paid attention to the information that actually the development of the Yimal has started already. And they are drilling first wells and they are building the most challenging part of the transportation system, so called by Daratsky Bay Cross. Uh, it's really technologically extremely challenging and for many years uh, people were doubting if it's realistic at all, but they are doing it. And last year they've spent $4 billion for all this development. This year it's $6 billion. So compared to Nabucco. So it's really, it's a real development. And uh, concerning financial crisis and all these challenges of investments, uh, you see Gazprom is acting inside the country and all their spendings uh, for capital and operational costs are in rubles. You know that uh, ruble is devaluating rather fast. So uh, actually uh, it's not such a, uh, for the same amount of money in dollar term, they can uh, make much a bigger investment program and they are not going to decrease it significantly. I mean the volume of the work to be done. Uh, moreover, uh, if we are speaking about financial capabilities, well, speaking frankly, Gazprom is a state-controlled company, and you know there is a very, very, very long line of companies coming to the Russian government and asking for support. Uh, do you think Gazprom will be the last one in this line to get some financial support if it's needed? And all these infrastructural uh, projects, of course, they can be regarded as a sort of uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, supporting national uh, steel producers, pipeline producers, and so on and so on. So I'm sure that in case of emergency, if there is lack of uh, capital and so on, the state will support Gazprom. But anyway, even now, Gazprom has long-term uh, contracts for exports. And for banks, it's the best guarantee of the return of uh, capital. So to get loans, Gazprom is in much better positions than many other companies all over the world. And um, Therefore, uh, now uh, the situation with Russian gas balance has changed dramatically. For the last five, seven years, the main idea was when Russia is run, uh, will run uh, out of gas, when we will see the shortage of Russian gas uh, this year, next year, or now the, the, the question is where, where, is, the the, where is our market? Uh. Yeah? Because domestic demand it is uh, decreasing dramatically, external demand is decreasing. Uh, North American LNG market, you know, uh, with this shale gas development in North America. Where is the market, actually? So now it's Russia waiting when the demand will again recover after the crisis. And so that's the problem. I've got two questions here. I'm going to take them together, please. Temur Yakubashvili from Georgia. Where is the market? Market is still there and trying to escape from you. <laughs> uh, and um, I mean, I little bit, I'm a little bit surprised because as far as I remember, you were the ones who kicked out the Western companies from developments, the fields that you are referring to. And I doubt very seriously that Gazprom has the technology to develop those fields or money. And Gazprom is the one who has the trouble getting credits or paying for credits. And that's also the public knowledge that's not invented by me. But what I wanted to say is uh, I hear a lot about uh, energy security being diversifying the supply routes. August war between Georgia and Russia showed that that's not enough because BTC, Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline and Baku Tbilisi Erzurum pipeline were targeted by the missiles coming from Russia, the same missiles that they were trying to aim at you from uh, Kaliningrad. I'm talking about uh, and these Iskander missiles, and I can assure you that those pipelines are very far from Abkhazia and South Ossetia. 38 bombs were dropped there. Fortunately, all of them missed. So it's not only enough to have a 
uh, alternative supply route. It should be defended as well. And as we see now, it's not only closing the tap, but also pro probably closing the airspace from the bombs that can drop on those pipelines. Interesting point. Thank you. Thank you. Reka Samerkeni coming from Hungary. I would be very interested also in the Russian reading of uh, two of the, I think, most important consequences of this January's uh, gas crisis. Uh, and uh, namely that I think this gas crisis uh, killed or shattered at least two major Central European or Central Eastern European energy strategies by one shot. Uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> energy strategies that was uh, proven uh, non-functional by this crisis was the Bulgarian, but I would also add the Serbian uh, energy security strategy, which was that uh, by nurturing very friendly and close relations with Russia, you can ensure energy supplies for your country. The other energy security strategy that I think was very characteristic uh, in Central, or especially for Slovakia, was that because Slovakia is a major transit uh, pipeline for, uh, for Russian gas transit towards major markets, uh, that in and of itself ensures Slovakia's energy security. Well, all of these countries were seriously hit by this crisis. Uh, one of the most immediate results was that Slovakia quickly announced its interest of linking its gas uh, supply system with Hungary. Uh, which is good in itself, but I would be very interested in the Russian reading of these uh, uh, potential close allies for Russia and uh, the potential uh, supporters of uh, cooperation. What, is the, uh, what was the uh, reaction? Is it simply life is tough, it's too bad, and once the crisis is over we can go back to business as usual without any consequences? Well, does it work? Yeah. Uh, you see, mm, uh, as a result of these questions, I get a feeling uh, that uh, the perception is uh, that uh, Russia, bad boy in a class, uh, decided uh, to uh, hurt uh, European countries and first of all uh, Central European countries uh, in this January. Well, uh, generally speaking, uh, Russia has suffered a lot and Gazprom, which is always accused as the world evil, yeah, uh, it has lost uh, more than $2 billion on all this uh, situation. So actually, you know, when uh, Russia, what I was trying to say at the very beginning of this session, when Russia has got into this situation in the beginning of January, it has only two alternatives. Whether, uh, number one, Ukraine is stealing gas <coughs> and not paying for it, and there is no mechanism to push it to pay for it. The second is we stop supplying Ukraine. So, you see, actually, if you are dealing in any other trade uh, negotiations, in any other trade deal, if you are selling some good to a customer who is refusing to pay for it, you stop the sales. Yeah? So, uh, there is no alternative, and you cannot force him to uh, fulfill his obligation. He is obliged to pay, but he isn't. Energy Charter Treaty doesn't work, and so on, and so on. So, here, uh, Actually, Russia didn't intend to hurt these Central European countries. Of course, it's not in our interest. <coughs> and of course, uh, Gazprom will do all efforts possible in order to avoid this. And of course, it will try uh, as much as possible to develop, uh, to participate in the development of the infrastructure. Nobody, nobody in Russia could even imagine such a situation that these countries could suffer so much because of this crisis with Ukraine, that such sort of crisis could happen. Just you one see? sentence, if I may, just on my own experience, it raised the anti-Ukrainian sentiment in Slovakia, what's happening in January. The last time I could hear this yesterday from the top politicians when we were discussing some issues. Anna Palacio, would an would a energy char charter treaty help? Well, I think that any uh, legal framework helps, and I think that the Energy Charter is not a perfect framework, but I, I mean, and frankly, Russia has been negotiating the Energy Charter as if to sign it, and in the end, we are in this, uh, in this very ambiguous, uh, I, I honestly mean, I'm, I, I think that in order to uh, 
to just to make, I mean, to to be part of a community. You have to accept the rules of this this community, and uh, I think that from the European Union perspective, we are willing and wishing and expecting a partnership in all areas of energy and. We could also speak of the partnership in, in nuclear with Russia. But of course, we expect Russia that, as, especially if, as in the, the, the charter, they, uh, Russia has been present at the negotiation table and has given all the signals that they would accept the, the treaty that they, they do. I mean, they are, they, there is a, a kind of uh, just uh, an agreement with uh, the negotiations. Let's go back to um, this side. Oshri Boda Demos, Europa in Warsaw. I would like to uh, move a little bit beyond uh, pipeline politics because energy security is uh, it's not uh, entirely about uh, the pipelines. Um, there, is, there are 10 countries uh, in the world with 80% of gas supplies. There are 23 with 80% of oil resources. Uh, but coal is much more democratically spread out mm -hmm. uh, if you look at it. Uh, um, Eco-technology used to be Europe's religion until recently. 60% of uh, the world's eco-technology market was uh, um, the EU. But that is changing very fast. Huh? China took over from Germany, the sunny capital of Europe, uh, as number one in solar energy in 2007. Uh, now, the, now Obama is uh, stealing the European show. He's, uh, hijacking the green Venus of Europe uh, in eco uh, technology. So we have the five billion uh, package adopted uh, today. There is a little bit for eco technology, 180 million euro for each of the uh, carbon capture and storage plants, which is not going to be enough for uh, anything. So the question is, do we have the priorities uh, sorted out and do we take uh, a holistic enough uh, picture in Europe of energy security? One more question I'm going to squeeze in and then I come back to you too. Am I still allowed to say something about pipelines? <laughs> uh, Peter Lorel, chairman of FIPRA. There is a uh, pipeline that has recently been granted permission in Germany from the network agency there uh, to connect where Nord Stream is going to hit northern Germany and the Czech Republic. I think it's called the Opal pipeline. This is currently in front of the European Commission for approval for funding. Um, what I'm interested in is apparently it is majority controlled by Gazprom. Is it the policy of Gazprom to have a pipeline across Germany that it will control to the Czech Republic? You seem to be looking at me. I certainly don't know. I'm looking at Tatiana. <laughs> okay. Um, shall we start with that and then go to okay. the holistic approach to right. energy security? So as far as I remember, I cannot swear, uh, the uh, project is developed by a Winters Hall. What is, uh, which is a joint venture, so Gazprom cannot control, uh, but definitely it has some share. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, it is the strategy of Gazprom to go as much downstream as it's possible, and not in order to switch anybody, but in order to, well, it's business. It's a strategy to capture the market in order to have guarantees of supply. If you are coming to the final consumer, First of all, it means that you are getting all the margin on the way. And secondly, it means that you have uh, secured this market. And then it means guarantees of consumption of all this gas in Yamal. Well, not all in Germany and, or Czech Republic, but uh, generally. Um, actually, grateful for your holistic approach. Um, because, so it's not all about gas. And, and um, I think if you talk seriously about even future prospects, the energy mix is issue is, is, is crucial. And um, also for specifically for Germany, the green Venus was there, it tends to travel, but it still needs, I think it still needs clothes on. And, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is actually a point I'd like to make is, um, first of all, I think that we also have, it's not only a question of competition now, whether it's Obama, who is taking up the issue, whether it's China, whether whoever it is, 
it's a question of complementarity, it's a question of how to, how to learn from each other, it's a question of how to use renewable aspects, for instance, I think there's so many opportunities in this, in this very field, and, 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 and we don't discuss it in the, to, to an extent we should actually discuss it. And this, this, this kind of, of technology offers not only the scope to 2020 and, and, and our abilities in, in Europe to, to, to reach the 20% margin, yes or no, which is a rather optimistic viewpoint, but I think we should discuss it much more intensely. So that's the first point. Second point, we need to combine it with nuclear energy. That's my very, that's not why, why this is not the reason that I want you award. And, and, and I know that we are still struggling in the grand coalition with that, um, in, in Germany with that very option. Personally, I'd say I would like to see a, a, an extension, a prolongation of the lifetime of our, of our nuclear plants. And, and as an added aspect to a, to a mixture, to, a, to an energy mix that, that really makes sense. Third, third point I'd like to make in this, in this regard, we haven't talked about energy efficiency so far. And, and, and uh, speaking in terms of, of possibilities, opportunities of, of, of technology measures we haven't even explored. And, and, and there again, the, the traveling green Venus offers many, 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 uh, many things to discuss about. So it's to take those three parts into one holistic view, as you have, as you have just mentioned it, I think we could do much more. And the sentences we have found now in our presidency conclusions could be filled with life here as well. Extending the lifespan of nuclear power plants, but not building new ones in Germany, at least. I think this first step is quite a, yeah. a, a significant one, if we make it true. <laughs> All right. I know, no, no, then do I get the award, then? Come October, <laughs> come October we will discuss it. Um, well, I think it was a great question. And, and frankly, I think that uh, Europeans, but everybody, but I think that there, Europeans and Americans, we have a responsibility. I think that we need to find a way to store renewable energy. Because what's the problem is that right now, the, the country that has a percentage, a, the highest percentage in Europe of renewables, which is Denmark, just, uh, just uh, produces CO2 per kilowatt eight times what France produces per kilowatt. Why? Because when the wind doesn't blow, you have to just start the, the, uh, the, the thermal uh, plants, and the thermal plants are very contaminating now. So first thing, we have to invest in research how to store, and not just expect the hydrogen, which is good, and we have to, but this is almost abstract research. We have to just find ways, practical ways today to store it. Second, in order to use renewable energy, we need to revamp the grid. We forget about the grid because the grid is about interconnections. And then once more we get into these issues about Europeans not just having these fantastic sentences in the conclusions of the, of the European Council. And I have contributed myself in the, my, my previous incarnations to draft them so that everybody finds a way out and something to tell our citizens, when we go back home, that we won and that we got what we wanted. But the, 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 the real thing is that we need interconnections. We need a smart grid in Europe. Unless we do that, we will never... F Last but not least, the third area where we have to invest and invest heavily is in, is in carb, uh, CO2 sequestration and storage. Why? Because, frankly, the, the, as, as you very well said, this is a very well spread all over. But let's be clear, another figure, China every year puts the, cap the capacity equal to Spain plus the Netherlands from coal today because they are launching their big nuclear and we, we should be happy because of CO2 because it's coal and very contaminating. I was uh, a couple of months ago, I was in India, and the Indian uh, energy minister told me, you know what, we are going to burn whatever we have. We have a very bad, yes, of course, I may. They, they, because the problem is that there, there is 1.6 billion people that do not have access to electricity. And you know what, if there is a correlation that has been proven is development, and electricity. And this is absolutely proven. You need a bulb to study. You need a bulb to start a, a, your, 
your, your, your business. So um, we need to invest in this. And, and, and frankly, I think that we should, and we, on, on this I think honestly that we have a responsibility. Europeans and Americans, we should be investing in these three areas, grid, uh, just storage for uh, renewables, and uh, CO2, and of course in nuclear, absolutely necessary. Why? Because this is base load, base load electricity. Right now, we, we, this is in, uh, in terms of uh, CO2, uh, it's just the most convenient in all aspects, and we could go on more details. Thank you. <coughs> I have a question for Carl Theodore zu Gutenberg about uh, energy policy. The Germans are normally pretty favorable to European integration, but they have been amongst the most reluctant to see common policies on energy because they have perhaps understandably wanted to pursue their own bilateral energy relationship with Russia. They want their own energy companies to have bilateral relationships with Gazprom. My question is about the impact of the Ukraine gas cutoff uh, on German political debate. You were not damaged yourselves, of course, because you get your gas from a, a Belarus pipeline, but are people in Germany now more willing to contemplate European policies on energy, particularly could they contemplate EU institutions negotiating with Russia, Turkmenistan, whoever, to set the political framework in which your companies co could operate? Has there been any shift in, in German thinking since, since January? Thank you. Can I have one more question in just there, yeah? Yes, uh, my name is Gr Grigory Nemiria. I'm Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine for European Affairs. Ukraine was so frequently mentioned that I think I deserve some time to comment and then to ask questions. Um, I was uh, amazed by the, uh, the, the logic of um, uh, Russian colleague Tatiana, uh, because the title of the panel is From Blame to the Responsibility. And it's... Uh, I, I suggest that instead of playing blame game, uh, does who steal what? Ukraine didn't steal a milligram of gas, and you know that perfectly. Commission said this openly. Commission of People said this in Kyiv publicly. So there is no need to continue to spread this uh, uh, false information. But I want to concentrate on the responsibility. So responsibility starts with the rules that are respected. And uh, the uh, respect starts with the confidence. Confidence requires resources, and not just money, but policies. And this is the key question. Whether do we have Europe a policies that uh, deserves to be respected, and if respected, are implementable and supported by uh, all the major players? And the answer is not. The energy market is fragmented, it's easily manipulated by the stronger actors instead uh, against of the, the weaker actors. And uh, as the focus of debate was Ukraine and the gas crisis, I should remind that the examples of the cutoff of the gas and oil supply are multiple. And it's not just about Ukraine. There's a number of other countries who suffered uh, from these policies or actions precisely uh, possible because of the lack of the enforcement and the policies that are respected by all. Ukraine not just signed but ratified European Energy Charter. Ukraine negotiating uh, an entrance to the uh, Energy Community Treaty and will become a member before the end of this year. So that's Ukraine that willing to be more compatible, uh, fully compatible with the EU standards on that. There is an energy dialogue between Russia and the uh, uh, European Union, which we fully support, but we want to see a result of this dialogue that would bring a more predictability to the uh, energy security uh, in Europe. So therefore, the question I want to ask of uh, the Russian colleague Tatiana, what the prospects do you think this energy dialogue uh, between the EU and Russia could bring for increasing the energy security. If Russia doesn't want to ratify the European Energy Charter and publicly say in this, what's the way out of this uh, situation when there is no legal framework that is respectable by all the players, the suppliers, the transitors, and the consumers? Right, thank you very much. And maybe somebody here on the panel can also update us on where the PCA negotiations uh, with Russia stand at the moment, because I understand we're talking energy there as well. Shall we start with you? 
Okay, because there was a previous question. Okay, so um, you see, uh, there are m many points. First of all, I completely agree with you that uh, the name of this, sen uh, this session is uh, From Blades to Responsibility. And actually, that was uh, my idea initially, <laughs> to start to speak about possible ways out. But uh, after all these um, uh, statements accusing Russia of uh, switching off, cutting off, and so on, actually, well, we ha I had to go into uh, some defense. And here I cannot agree with you, unfortunately. Uh, that uh, it was uh, that uh, Ukraine was not uh, mm, ruining any obligations, or well, you can uh, call it not stealing gas, but not transiting the whole amount of gas. But there are, I do not agree with your statements, and there are evidences on the Russian side that gas was disappearing in the Ukrainian uh, transportation system. Let's call it this way, if you want. And uh, anyway. Uh, we can uh, discuss it here for hours, and there will be many evidences from the both sides. I'm afraid that uh, everybody no, was go looking. Back from blame to yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we will come back to this uh, story. So we have Ukraine has its own vision of the situation. Russia has its own vision of the situation. I'm afraid here we we have to stop on this. But coming to the uh, something constructive and positive, yeah. Uh, here, uh, it is, um, if we start to speak about uh, the Energy Charter Treaty, I'm afraid what uh, this crisis has shown that uh, mechanisms, uh, just legal mechanisms of uh, this uh, treaty do not work. And uh, all the uh, contractual relationship between Ukraine and Russia, uh, they are not... Uh, how to say, it's not uh, the question of transparency, it's the question of the uh, legal uh, details written in all the contracts. They are not uh, well developed enough to be taken to the courts. They are not, uh, well, uh, all the relationship, contractual relationship between Russia and Ukraine are developing rather slowly with all these conflicts every year uh, trying to negotiate and uh, you know that the contract finally was uh, published in the internet, completely confidential contract, it was just thrown to the internet, uh, journalists were happy, uh, but if you look at this contract, uh, contract uh, one, it's available, you can see that from the legal point of view there are many, many weak points in it. And if you take it to the court, uh, the decision is not clear because you can stay in this court for a decade trying to find the truth and trying to find, again, who was guilty, who is to be blamed, uh, where the gas disappeared because of the metering system and so on. You know how it is uh, working. So uh, the very okay. system of this gas trade between uh, Russia, Ukraine and Europe, it is not uh, well transparent and well developed enough uh, to, uh, to be um, workable in the situation of lack of trust. Yeah? In the Soviet time, no problem. We trusted everybody and it was working perfectly. Uh, but now, you see, uh, and probably the idea, the, the, the uh, way out from this, the way out from this tunnel is uh, just uh, to develop legal framework. Or, or, to develop or, 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 in I all the you details. Must, you two are going to continue the conversation in the bar. <laughs> We've only got about five <laughs> minutes left. Um, we still have a lot of um, issues to discuss, so hopefully we'll... Um, we can continue that um, discussion later over a drink. Is the German position shifting? <laughs> does it does it need does it need to shift? What an <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> there, 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 there seems to be some confirmation here. No. Must, must have come from Austria probably, but <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, what an interesting observation, Charles. Um, I, let, let me answer it this way. I, I referred to the sentence speaking with one voice before. And, and I, I mean it very seriously now. I think um, um, that's one, that very sentence falls on, on, on fruitful grounds when you talk to Germans at the moment, to, ger to the German public and also within the German government and I would say all over the party lines. Um, speaking with one voice does not mean for us speaking with a German voice, but with a European voice. And we 
are very strong supporters of the energy chart that we were just talking about. We try to bring in the proposals we have decided on uh, yesterday and today when we were having the question of maybe on gas issues, reverse flow, maybe, maybe on the question of um, adding a regional dimension, which is not only an intra-German regional dimension, but a dimension which is goes across cross border um, on the minimum standards on lowering the threshold when it comes to um, um, uh, to the question of, of 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 the coordination group of the European coordination group so just as a couple of examples um, that we are really trying to hold this hold this momentum as well secondly um, the Germans talking about also the German public has the gas crisis changed anything I'd say that uh, the romantic thoughts within the German public when it comes to dependency on Russian gas um, was already limited since quite a while. And, and this is the mildest phrase, the most euphemistic phrase I can find tonight, limited. And, and it's, it's actually even more. And so the, it's, it's, it, I'd say it's even more pressure also on the German government to, 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 to really go on with uh, diversification and other issues and to seek a European platform. And I think we try, really try to, to support this very European platform. And again, an interesting observation, um, but I would actually like to reject it. Thank you. You were wanting to make a comment on the well, issue of trust. Uh, well, a comment as a lawyer. You know, uh, if weak contracts cannot go to tribunals, tribunals have to close. Because frankly, when a contract is very clear, you don't have a problem. You don't go to a tribunal. So I, I honestly, I, I don't think that this is a good argument, if, f frankly, on, on this issue. But that's just my, my, uh, my legal safe, uh, self. On uh, German policy, well, um, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I don't know it in, in detail, so I just know the, from the perspective of Siemens. And uh, Siemens just now, I would say very generously, just uh, uh, being commercializing in the world uh, Rosatom, uh, but nuclear products, which is, eh, eh, we are, as from an Areva point of view, we are happy to uh, to I mean, to <laughs> do business <laughs> with with this uh, with this joint venture of Siemens uh, just commercializing in uh, in the in Europe uh, Rosatom products. Is this governmental policy, or is it a policy between companies? Well, you know, this maybe you can tell us. I would really love to know it. <laughs> just, just, to, just to bring some clarity, this refers to Siemens striking a, a, a strategic alliance with Rosatom, the Russian energy monopoly, um, and trying to extricate itself from its one-third stake in no, Arriva. No. I mean, th this contract is very clear. They, they take the money and they go. Everything else, all the engineers, all the patents, everything is Arriva. Is Arriva. So there is no, there, ha, there has, has been certain ambiguity. Siemens has a fantastic label, a fantastic, and, and Rosatom has good technology. So, I mean, it's, I don't know what the, what the role of the governments have been there. And honestly, I'm dying to I. know it. <laughs> I'm dying to know it. I'm dying to know it. It's, it is said that uh, a former chancellor has been going often to to a uh, to Moscow Re and not to, to discuss about uh, I, I gas. Can, I can I can see a, a German French inquiry commission coming up here into the government policy on that. We've only got a couple of minutes. Can I ask you to keep one minute each and one minute each, and then we have to wrap up. Question, Valentin from the EU Observer to Mr. von Gutenberg. Uh, you said that uh, this romantic view of, uh, the, the, of Russia in, in Germany is already gone for quite a while. Uh, then why is the government still pursuing Nord Stream, which really dates back to a very romantic relationship between Chancellor Schroeder and uh, then President Putin? Wouldn't it be maybe a sign of goodwill and trust and confidence to the Eastern Europeans to um, 
redesign maybe Nord Stream through the Baltics and Poland. It would be cheaper and it would serve the same purpose to bring uh, gas from Stockman to, to Germany and the Europeans. Thank you. Thanks. And just behind you. Yep. One remark and one question. For, first a remark, I think we should not be naive about the fact that private companies in the field of energy are acting totally independently from the governments. Yeah. We've never seen that in any fields. Uh, so I think we should just face the reality. Then, uh, then a question. Given the fact that we are facing huge difficulties uh, with the non-reliability of the main gas provider, which is Russia, and given the fact that there is a huge need now in uh, nuclear energy, uh, whereas there is also a need of unified European policy when you try to sell a reactor, you have to have the authorization from the 27 national security uh, um, uh, structure in the 27 European countries. So there is a huge need of having a common European policy in the field of energy, which doesn't exist uh, e today, which is not e neither in the Lisbon Treaty. So what are the obstacles and why isn't it possible to move forward at last to a real European energy policy? Um, very good question. Um, I'm, we're going to wrap up now, so i am perhaps yeah, give okay. each of you two minutes to make any final statements and address the questions if you wish. And why don't we start with Anna Palacio? Well, I think that this is the key question. The answer is political will. Frankly, let's call a, a, a spade a spade, political will. And you are absolutely right. It doesn't make sense that you license a reactor in France and you have to license it in, in Great Britain and it takes a long time and a lot of money. And then you go to India and India, uh, Indian authorities, well, uh, have a very, uh, a very light process because the, this reactor has been licensed in, in France. Well, I, I frankly, what I fear, because I'm a, a die to the wool, um, just European, I mean, Europeanist. I, this is, I think, uh, European construction is, is the, the greatest, uh, really the greatest dream and at the same time achievement of many generations. But, and I think that our challenge is in the energy field where we have public opinion that just is favorable to, to just to sort out this mess. And if there is no uh, political will, well then let's think about having a, a I mean, something like uh, we have had in, uh, in the interior, a kind of Schengen of the energy. Why not? Let's get a group of willing countries and let's go forward because there is a need. There is absolutely a need the same way that there was a need for the free circulation of people and we will we, be we'll, we'll responding to this need. No, no, excuse me, sorry, no. Um, Sasha Mondra. Uh, why there is not, I think it's pretty clear because, you know, we are dependent on oil and gas and it comes from the countries uh, where it's a part of their national policies. Then it's nuclear, and there are still different views in, in, in Europe. There are the countries who, do, who are not in favor. Uh, so I think it's the function of this. Uh, somebody asked about, about the energy charter. There, there are two to tango on that, and uh, you know the first charter was not signed by Russia, although it was signed by 50 something states. The second attempt, we are still waiting for a proposal. So, uh, sorry. you know, that's not just an area where we can do the things without just mapping and, and, and uh, taking into account uh, these roles of the actors outside of Europe. That's, that's the reason why we do not have a, a single energy policy. And look, with the coal, 
I think it could be possible, but we are doing our best to complicate uh, the, the use of coal in, in, in our power generating sector. Uh, to follow this, you know, to, full, to fulfill the commitments regarding the CO2 uh, uh, emission reduction, basically we need to do the two things. Uh, you know, all those talks about the renewable CCS, that's either the song of a very distant future or uh, there are the serious limits. So it's about the nuclear energy and it's about the savings or, you know, we call this energy efficiency in, in, in housing. Those two areas, they can help us. Uh, but nuclear, it's, it's difficult to have a common, common, common attitude until there are still the countries who, who, who don't want to, to, to take this road. Tatiana, is Russia ready to tango? Uh, you know, <laughs> if uh, if come back to the transatlantic dimension, it's not only Russia that hasn't ratified energy charter, but also United States, which haven't signed it at all. And generally speaking, there are uh, several countries that are not uh, uh, very happy about the energy charter treaty, uh, simply because I'm speaking about Russian position. It's not answering Russian needs, and it's not interesting from the uh, as a document. It doesn't take into account our interests. If you are making any deal between different participants, all the participants have to get something uh, attractive from this deal. For Russia, the energy charter in its current uh, formulation, it's not attractive, especially with this integrational am amendment, which makes European Union the uh, whole uh, tra transit territory, uh, and so all transit uh, protocol cannot be applied for it, for example. So there are uh, several issues like that uh, which make it unattractive for Russia. It doesn't answer our interests, so uh, therefore uh, Russia doesn't what ratify. Your, what are your interests? Well, if Can uh, you define the interests? There are, there are many of our interests, but, but interest in the profits. If we are speaking about and energy energy trade, it's profits, maximizing profits and uh, minimizing losses and risks. If that's you it. if you would sign the energy charter as it stays, you would lose the profit. It doesn't guarantee our uh, our profits uh, in uh, our relationship with the transit states. It doesn't defend our interests in transit protocol, so therefore it's not attractive. And uh, the problem is that uh, what uh, actually I feel uh, feel um, a little bit disappointed after uh, this our discussion, uh, because uh, finally we get to blame each other, and we didn't uh, speak uh, about any uh, positive uh, movements in all this uh, legal framework, especially with the Energy Charter Treaty. Well, it took 15 years to understand that it doesn't work. Probably it's now time to try to start from the beginning and to start to, to make any other document that could work. Because uh, you see, with so many participants in the international trade, uh, energy trade, and so many transit countries evolving in any pipeline you take, for example, uh, it's absolutely necessary to have something like uh, with sea trade, they have this sea code and all the ships coming to the port, they know the rules. With energy trade, we don't have anything like that. Oh so dear, discussion, discussion is stuck. Um, Ms. Sof-Gutenberg, um, we rely on you to give us an optimistic outlook for European energy policy. <laughs> <laughs> that we gotta have to answer the Nord Stream. <laughs> No, uh, very, very quickly, uh, on the optimism, I come with my latest <laughs> remarks. Very, very quickly, first, first of all, um, <laughs> we, we were asking for coherence, for complementarity, for common means, for other things, and we ha always have a tendency of mutual finger-pointing, very good, but um, this is probably connected to any energy question, energy issue. On Nord Stream, also, in, in one quick remark, um, it's certainly not about romanticism, the lovely questions are always the last ones, but um, it's certainly not, a, not only about romanticism, it is about, it's, it is, uh, to a certain extent, without sounding cynical, on pragmatism and hopefully also on style. And, and I underline the word style, and that was missing 
sometimes in that very regard. And I'm looking at my Swedish friends, I'm looking at my Polish friends and to others. And Carl Bill sitting over there. And maybe also a point we could discuss at the bar. Um, if style's missing, we do have a problem. Last point um, on optimism. I'm very optimistic, optimistic that tomorrow somebody's sitting on this place and won't have to suffer of this remarkable aircon, which is blowing exactly on this place here. <laughs> it's freezing <laughs> maybe, up here. Maybe we can fix that. It's, it's ice cold. And thank you very much indeed, GMF, tonight. It was the first night this week that I didn't have to talk about cars and the automotive sector. <laughs> 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 and just highly enjoyable. All the best for the proceedings within the next two days. Thank you. I don't know about you, I really enjoyed the debate and we shall see you in the bar.